modular design in PIX and JAL. Most of us started in a DIY development environment, and those tend to look like this. Um, either development boards, a simple Vero board, or the more structured ones that have groups of three and power rails running between them and stuff like that. Top left there is a standalone level crossing with orange lights and red lights and servos to operate bars and all that. The whole lot in one wee board uh, that was then developed into something else, somewhere else. But a lot of us tend to do development work like that. If you're taking it very, very seriously, or if the project's maybe a wee bit more serious than that, you might find yourself doing something like that. That's a single-sided PCB. In fact, that's a series of single-sided PCBs. The, the bottom one there is a TC77 temperature chip from back in the day, and literally decided to do that at five o'clock on a Saturday night, and had that little board made by the seven o'clock simply drawing by hand, it's an SM device, and drawn by hand with one of these Dalo pens. So there's all sorts of ways of doing PCBs. Nowadays, our friends in the East tend to help us with printed circuit boards. And so those are more recent boards of mine that are double-sided, um, room for a prototyping area and room for bits and bobs. And that's kind of where a lot of people are. However, if you've ever tried using microchips development offering, they're a very strange beast. Let's have a look at one or two of them. There's one there. That's from 2003. And if you look at it, most of it's not there. The LIN controller is that there's area for it, and it tells you where to put the chips and the resistors, but it's not there. Same with the motor driver board and the canned oscillator and the, the EEPROM and all these bits aren't on that board. You have to decide what bits you want and put them on yourself, including, I noticed, the contrast for the LCD display. That's an option in that board. And there's no great connections off. If you notice, there's a, set, a, sing, a single set of DuPont pins that aren't soldered in there, but if you want to solder them in, you can do that. Time went on, microchip get better. That one's got DuPont pins, plus it's got that edge connector. Here's another one for a couple of years later. It's got two sets of Berg plugs, two different sets of Berg plugs with different pitches and different numbers of pins. So if you've got a board, I can see at least four ways of plugging it in there, possibly six or eight ways of plugging it in there. And I'll bet you only one of them works. And the next generation of boards had edge connectors, but the edge connector sticking out the side doesn't match the edge connector sticking up. And if you're doing proper breadboard and hard sort of uh, electronics, that's the, the breadboarding extension that microchip sell you for their development boards. And if you notice, there's an edge connector over to the left of that, and that matches some boards, but not others. In short, it's a moger, it's a mess, it's a real guddle. The boards are very, very dense. They're partially populated, which means you fill in the bits you want, you don't fill in the bits you don't want, and you've got to be able to solder. Not everybody's in this game to solder, some people are developing because they're developing for other people to make it, they don't want to, to be sold on. They bring everything out, but not in any particular order. You get RB2, RB3, RG4, RF3, and stuff like that going down the, the line of pins. They're very, very difficult to initially understand. Once you've built something on it and you understand it and you've traced all the wires and all that, it's easier. But initially, they're hard work. And there's lots and lots of jumpers on them. And if you get the jumper wrong, sometimes it just doesn't work. Sometimes the, the peripheral that you're trying to work with isn't connected. 
But in other cases, if you put the jumper in the wrong place, you get five volts instead of three volts, and that can ruin your morning. And so there's lots and lots of issues. And at the bottom, I put big compatibility issues. And I thought, I could talk about that. And then I thought, no, I've got a better idea. That's just the rakings off the top of one of my drawers from microchip bits. And there's seven or eight different boards, all with different connectors, all in different directions. Some have got two connectors, some have got one connector, some have got connectors that go through, some have got connectors that don't. Most of them will fit one of the development boards and one of the development boards only. And it really is a mess. So for that reason, I propose that we don't start from there. Let's start from somebody else that's doing it just a wee bit better. I've developed a number of things on field programmable gate arrays, FPGAs. Now an FPGA is a big old chip like um, about the size of one of these better microcontrollers, except for none of the wiring on it is complete. You give the wiring to it in a, an EEPROM, a serial EEPROM, and when you switch it on, it loads its own wiring and it becomes whatever circuit you want it to be. They're brilliant things. When you're developing them, what you do is you develop it at a system level, an architecture level. You say, I want an analog input, I want a two encoder inputs from rotary encoders in quadrature, I want two switches in, and I want three status LEDs and an SD card out. And then you start, and from the system architecture, you develop the logic. And there's four different ways of developing the logic for an FPGA. First of all, the schematic capture. Now, schematic capture uh, is the, the intuitive one when you're learning that game, because you can draw flip-flops and gates and inputs and outputs and join the dots and draw circuits and all that good stuff. But if you're doing a 16-bit processor, that gets awful slow, awful quick, and it's very easy to make mistakes. So very, very few people do schematic capture, except for in the most basic situations. VHDL. The VHDL stands for Very High Speed Integrated Circuit. That's what the V stands for. Very High Speed Integrated Circuit Hardware Definition Language. And it looks a lot like JAL. You see the entity PID controller is. The is thing that you get in JAL comes straight from here. And the comments are all hyphen hyphen to give you a comment. It actually has the look and feel of a JAL program. And so if you've done a wee bit of JAL, you maybe find this very straightforward. They say it's based on Pascal, but then they also say that JAL's based on Pascal. So that's maybe the common heritage. Next, Verilog. Now Verilog is more C-like in its structure. Uh, functions with beginnings and ends and so on. And again, like C, it has the same comments and the same structures and the same chunkiness. And again, it's very, very useful. Lastly, IP. Now, IP is intellectual property. And basically, that's something that somebody else wrote. The somebody else can be you, or the somebody else can be somebody else. If you use Xilinux or Microchip or Lattice or Intel or any of the big players that are doing FPGAs, they will sit, not, they'll either give you or sell you. Most often they'll give you IP chunks like processors or arithmetic logic units or memory controllers or stuff like that. But equally well, you can use your own IP. I've got IPs for seven segment display decoders and ripple counters and stuff like that. And basically what you do is you include chunks of other people's code, and then you just put the stuff in to join the dots. Either way up, whichever of the four techniques you use to actually do the design, you end up in a really complicated IDE. And this is an old one. This is the old ISE for Xilinux. Don't worry about it. 
There's lots and lots of stuff going on there, but the only thing I want to show you is there's this little thing up there called a constraints file or a UCF file. The UCF is user constraints file. And what that does is it tells the system when it's compiling things what input and what output has to be on what pin. Here's one. In this circuit, the crystal, it's a crystal clock and it's a 32 megahertz oscillator and it's on location pin 89 and it's low voltage CMOS and it's 31.25 nanoseconds. 31.25 nanoseconds is 32 megahertz. Uh, you can see location P18 has got an anode for the seven segment. P23 has got the decimal point for the seven segment. And basically all that is is a text file that tells me I want that signal to go in or come out on that pin. And if you're working in FPGAs, then you use these. So here's an FPGA development board. The chip in the middle, the Arctic 7, is a big FPGA. At the bottom, you see a load of switches and then a load of LEDs, and then a load of seven segment displays. And at the top, there's a VGA, and there's audio, and there's USB, and there's all the usual suspects. But what there isn't is edge connectors or any of that stuff. Instead of that, you get these things round about the outside. And these are what are called PMODs, P-M-O-D. And PMOD is a thing that Digilant have been doing now for about a decade. You get these little modules. Very, very simple. As you can see, the connections are simply right angled pins. And they come, they do all sorts of stuff. They're up there, there's an OLED, an RS-485, an SD, real-time clock, a DGA output. A can, all these things, but they're simply little peripherals and they're cheap and they're ubiquitous. Farnell currently have about 150 of them, but right now Farnell doesn't have very much of anything because of the, the chip, chip again type thing going on. But you can pay from three pounds, four pounds, up to about 20 pounds for these. And as you see, there's joysticks, AED converters, fast AED converters, solid state relays, differential pressure, you name it, there's a PMOD to do it. And you don't need to be plugging it into an FPGA, you can just plug it into a picture or you can plug it into a, a bit of airboard. The standard itself is really, really simple. There's six pins by two rows on that connector. Two pins are ground, two pins are VCC. Now that can be 3.3 volts or it can be five volts. You decide, you're the designer. And the other pins are general purpose. Now that actually is two PMODs, an upper one and a lower one. The actual PMOD standard is for the six pin connection with one VCC, one ground, and then four IOs. But in general, nearly all the PMODs that you come across will have the 12 pin connector on them. Now, Digilent offered a standard up for this stuff. And there's a, if you go to the Digilent website, there's a PDF of the standard which tells you how far apart those pins have got to be and, and all that stuff. But they're the standard 0.1 pitch pins that we all know and use daily, so there's nothing really in the, the standard. The one thing they do do, though, is they offer suggestions for how to wire up certain peripherals, like I squared C, SPI, I squared S, H bridges, UARTs, stuff like that. And they offer a, how to do it on a, a single-sided one with just the first six pins and how to do it with a double-sided one. Now, a lot of people stick to this standard because let's say I've got an H-bridge for 
Uh, I'm experimenting with uh, DCC at the minute, and I've got an H bridge set up there, and it's a one amp H bridge, and it's wee and it's tight, and it lives on my my desk, and I can get things working with it, and that's great. And if I then want to take it to a club layout and plug it in, I want to replace the one amp H bridge with a five amp H bridge. If the H bridges are to the same standard, then literally I just pull out the one amp one and leave it in the house and plug in the five amp one and all the connections are the same and we're off to the races. Meanwhile, a company that I have mentioned on here before, Microelectronica, who are out of Belgrade, the capital of Serbia, have been going their own way in a similar direction. What they're known for, what their background is, is they do big open development boards for education and for the hobbyist. These things are utterly enormous. A4 size is not unusual. And they've got lots and lots of connectors on them, but very few jumpers. So you can connect one thing to another, but you don't put many jumpers in to disconnect peripherals or reconnect peripherals. It's all done by long jumper wires with a female at either end. They also have their own languages for, for micros, micro basic, micro C and micro or micro Pascal. I'll come back to these later on in the discussion as things start to crystallize a wee bit. There's one of their analog boards, uh, half a dozen op amps, a couple of power supplies, um, digitally analog converters, analog to digital converters. If you are teaching analog electronics, that would be a godsend. But if you want to learn a bit of analog electronics, that would be a godsend. I think that comes in about 60 quid though, so it's maybe not the cheapest way of doing it. <clears throat> there's one of the digital boards for picks. And if you look, there's 40 switches there, there's 40 LEDs, there's both an LCD display, an LCD character display, and an LCD graphics display, plus all the ports, plus the programmer, everything's on there, but there's very few in the way of jumpers, it's all plug a wire in here and loop over to there and plug it in, plug a wire in there and loop it over. Compare that with that fella that we looked at earlier. It's much, much easier to use. So there are different use cases here. The, the microelectronica stuff is designed for students and hobbyists. Lots of peripherals, lots of things to play with, they're all there and you can do, use it for lots of things. Whereas the professional user is looking for fewer peripherals. He only wants the one or two that's going on to this job. Specific peripherals, he wants a, an H bridge and he wants a, an SD card and nothing else, or he wants, you know, he wants a DCC input and a DCC output, he doesn't need any of that other stuff. And so Micro came up with these clickboards that I mentioned, I think it was in December time. And there's their specification. It looks not unlike a, a 16 pin chip socket, except for it's just a wee bit wider. It's 0.9 of an inch pitch rather than 0.6 of an inch pitch, which is what a normal wide chip socket is. If you look carefully at that diagram, you'll notice there's a complete SPI interface over there. There's a complete I squared C interface there. There's a complete UART interface, transmit and receive there plus PWMs, analogs, interrupts, and a couple of supplies. But the thing is, they make an awful lot of these boards. I started putting this little presentation together in December, and at that point, they had 1174 of these clickboards. They put one new clickboard onto their website per day. Every day, a new clickboard. In February, they were up to 1,245. Yesterday, 1,280. Right? And if you look at the, 
the index down the left hand side there, 425 different sensor boards, uh, 56 display and LED boards, that's e-paper, LCD, LEDs, what do you call them, it's NeoPixels, every kind of display you can think of, all covered in that. Um, lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of things. If you go to their site, what they'll give you is the most recent ones that have turned up. Uh, and there's the price range is fairly typical there as well. Thermo 23, that's the 23rd thermal measurement board, $6. And two along from it, a flash RAM board for $39. So it depends on what you want and it depends on the chip that's on it. But there's lots and lots and lots of these. Farnell have got about 500. There's 390 in the other embedded computers space, right? And again, they go from two or three pounds up to 20 or 30 pounds, depending on what it is. If you go and look at one of these, I'm not suggesting you go and buy one, just go and look at one on Micro's own website, then here's what you get. You get the advert for it, what it is and what it looks like and what it does and what chip it uses. You get the complete circuit diagram. So if you don't want to buy micros and you want to make your own, there's how it's done. Now this one is a, a particular favourite of mine. I've got one of these. And the reason that I've got one is that Back when you, you saw the old microchip development boards, the old microchip development boards all had a two-line LCD display on them. And that two-line LCD display always worked on a, an MCP23S17 port expander. And it was always there. And you could write libraries to put your debugging information out to the the microchip LCD, because it was going to be on the development board. And so I've got lots of libraries of stuff that will write to that board. So for that reason, one of those, if I get a microchip board now that doesn't have an LCD on it, I plug this in and I've got an LCD on it. Meanwhile, back to their web page, what else have we got apart from the, the circuit diagram check? Well, there's the pinouts and there's how the pins on the little socket match the pins on the little clickboard. There's the contrast pot, there's the pulse width modulation for the backlight, and there's how to drive the LCD. Anything else on the web page? Why funny you should ask. There's a code snippet of how to use it. And is that all? No, that's not all. There's also a link to Libstock. And Libstock contains a library of firmware and software for this one module. There's how to drive it in Mic Pro, Micro Pro Basic for the ARM processor and for AVR processors and for 30, DS PIC 33s, for PIC 24s and for FT90 processors and for 8 bit PICs, 32 bit PICs. And they've also got all the same stuff for C for all of those processors. And then they've got it in Pascal for all of those processors. There's a ton of material there. There's a software library, there's examples, there's help files, and there's hex files for all of those processors, for all of those languages, for that wee chip. And that stuff's free to download. You can go there and have a, look, have a look if you fancy it. It's straight out of the Micro website. So you're not limited to using their dev boards with these things. There's a Arduino Nano driving a CAN bus controller. That's the standard CAN bus controller with the MCP2551 chip on it. And the option, the, the jumper on it, <coughs> lets me decide if it's got the termination or not. They're not limited to the one inch form factor.
There's a Bluetooth audio, one for driving LEDs, one for battery management, and one for doing RF, RFIDs. And if they're not expandable enough for you, there's one for driving 40 extra pins. There's one for taking it all out to wires. And there's another one there for driving 16 servos all at the same time. And again, every one of these comes with a circuit diagram, examples on how to use it, all the firmware, all that stuff for all the processors. Now, they're not open source, these things, but they're very, very open. The, the connections are all 0.1 inch pitch standard pins, the same thing that we've all got drawers full of. You don't need proprietary connectors. You don't need any special tooling. The, over to the left there, you'll see a PMOD that's got an SSD card socket for it, so I can drive an SSD card into anything that I plug that into. And below it, you'll see the Vero board that we use for the pocket money kits. And that's the, the Vero board for the pocket money kits set up with a PMOD interface on the end of it, so that I can plug it into a development board and develop pocket money kits on it. In the same way, over to the right, you'll see a standard microbus module. That one's a magnetometer, I think. And below it, you'll see a dev board that's actually just a prototyping board from our friends in China with two rows of pins soldered into it. And that's now a dev board for developing something else on. Developing something else on. Explain that to me, Chick. Okay. You use these like Lego for development work. Here's an example. At the bottom of the screen, there's a sprog. Above it, there's a 12 volt supply supplying the sprog. The sprog's driving track A, and connected across track A is one of these little prototyping boards. There's got a DCCIO on it. DCC input with an opto isolator and the shock keys goes into the pick chip, the pick chip does its magic and sends the answers back out via an H bridge. If you look closely, you can see the H bridge right in the center of the screen there. Just the standard L293D H bridge, which drives track B. And in the middle, the pick chip looks at packets, DCC packets and filters them and decides what's going through and what's not and what's getting augmented that can change one packet into four, it can change one packet into a, a series of packets, all depending on whatever code I put into that chip via the, the programming socket over to the left-hand side of the, the circuit there. The LCD click at the top pushed in there, and that just gives me a display to let me see what's going on. The DCC thing pushed into the bottom click to do the work. If I was finished with this, I'm still not finished with it, but if I did finish with it and I wanted to make a prototype out of it, I would use the chip. I wouldn't use any of the programmer stuff over to the left-hand side of the prototyping board. I'd use the big chip. I'd use what's on the, the DCC board. And that would be all. The rest of that would, would disappear once the development's done. Um, speaking of Raspberry Pi, since people noticed my T-shirt, there's one. <clears throat> that Raspberry Pi has got a couple of seven-segment displays hanging out the side of it, and it's got a GPS hanging out the bottom of it. Right, that's a PMOD GPS. One of the standard signals that comes out of a GPS receiver is the one PPS signal, which is one pulse per second. And that one pulse per second is regulated by the atomic standards on the satellites, which are really, really, really accurate. They're accurate to one part in 10 to the 10 or 10 to the 11. And so using that one pulse per second pulse to, med, to count cycles of the clock, you can make an ordinary crystal oscillator accurate to about one part in 10 to the ninth, a part per billion, 
by disciplining it over the GPS. And this was developing code for that to make a, a, a GPS disciplined oscillator. Now, it's been said that we're all great empiricists here. The circuits that we're using in these PMODs and micro, micro, micro electronica things are all published. So we can borrow the circuits, the schematics. We can borrow the firmware because that's open source as well. We can borrow the library code because that's open source. We can borrow it all, the whole lot that is there if you want it. So after a few years of this, Microchip saw what was going on and adopted some of this stuff. They started by putting peripheral pin select PPS on their chips. Initially, about a decade ago, it was the 24 series and the DS PIC 33s that had PPS on them because they were a separate animal. It's now been rolled out to nearly all the 8 bit modern parts. The, the older ones, the 16F, 676s and 675s and uh, stuff like that. Sorry, no, they don't have it. But any more modern chip will have this per peripheral pin select, which means you can route practically any I.O. pin to any physical electrical pin in the side of the chip. The same way as you can do with an FPGA, which means a pick board can now use a PMOD or a micro. All I have to do is assign the lines correctly. And for that reason, Microchip have started adopting this in their products. Now, you saw this one when I did the, the autonomous servo about Christmas time. Uh, and basically, it's a little breakout board for the 16F18855 which is a smashing part, um, but that micro bus on top of it means that you can plug in a thousand things to, to make, to experiment with on that wee cheap, I think that was about 11 pound that wee board. And the bottom of it is a programmer and debugger as well. This is the Curiosity high pin count board. Now, I had one of these and I've used it for a couple of years and I love it, it's a great thing. That was the one that you saw a wee bit earlier on with the, the DCC filter thing on it. It's got two microbus sockets on it. And so impressed was I with that, that when Andrew Crossland was selling one on the, the forum recently, I snapped it up so I had a spare in case that one ever dies because it's a a really, really useful wee piece of kit for doing this sort of development work. But even better yet, Microchip have just started bringing out these nano boards, as they call them, the Curiosity nano boards. And there's a Curiosity nano baseboard that's got three of these microbus sockets on it. There it's there. But the socket that you plug the processor into on it is fascinating as well. I went to Farnell for a look. Farnell have currently got 20 different Curiosity nano boards that go into that socket. But look there, there's picks for sure. There's pick 16s and pick 18s, but there's also AVRs, AT tinies, at megas. There's ARM Cortex processors. There's SAM processors. There's 32 bit picks. There's DS picks. Whatever it is you have to develop in, you can probably find one of those boards to do it. And you have to remember that every one of those boards, apart from having the chip on it, has also got that wee bit over to the left, which contains a programmer and a debugger. So for the that wee board, I think costs 20 pounds. But for that, you can program, what is it, 1200 different peripherals in any combination you fancy with 20 or 30 different flavors 
of microcontroller, not just 20 or 30 different microcontrollers, but 20 or 30 different flavors of microcontroller. And every one of them, you get a, de a debugger and a programmer. And the stuff over to the left of that clickboard that's in there is battery management. So it'll all run off a lithium polymer battery. If you want to make something, uh, I don't know if Colin's still working on next year's greenhouse project, but by God, this would be a stonker for it. So because they're now in a roll, Microchip has started putting these, there's the current 16 and 32 bit Explorer board. And up at the top, you'll see there's two PMOD connectors and there's two Microbus connectors. That 8 bit Explorer board, then it's there. Two Microbus connectors up at the top for putting these things on. And two PMOD connectors down at the bottom for putting PMODs in as well. And then there's software. Some of you may remember this. This is the MP Lab X development environment, and it's got MCC, the microchip code configurator, open. Over to the left, we have the usual onboard resources. This is the project that I did earlier on, the autonomous servo thing for driving four or five servos off a, a pick chip without having to think about servos. Over to the left, we have the onboard resources that we always get, timers and numer numerically controlled oscillators and UAPs and things like that. But also there is the content manager. Most folk don't get near the content manager, but if you click on it, you will find there's a bunch of libraries and one of the libraries is the Microelectronica Click Library. And if you select that, it downloads. And two minutes later, you've then got a selection of Microelectronica Clicks that Microchip support. Now that, extent, that list there isn't nearly as extensive as Microelectronica's is. Theirs has got nearly 1,300 in it. That one's got about 75 or 80 in it at the minute. But it's got all the important ones. So let's do an example. If I go to interface, there's 20 milliamp interfaces. There's CAN, Ethernet, uh, expansion, MCP 2003, RS 232, USB to I2C, USB to, to SPIs. Let's have a look at the CAN. I go in there and select the CAN controller and I add it to my project. It appears up in the project. I get the easy setup panel. That'll tell me what the board looks like and what its click, its click number is and where to get it and how much it costs. If I go into configuration, there's the CAN bus settings. So I can set my CAN bus up to do what I, I need it to do. Down at the bottom, the notifications panel on MCC is telling me where I need to make changes to get this to work. And once I've allocated the pins to get it to work, I press generate. And lo and behold, not only does it generate the header file and the programming file to use it, it also generates a complete example for me on how to use this CAN controller. Now this CAN controller is just the standard MCP2551, but think how long it takes you to go and rig up a development board with a, an MCP2551 on it and terminate it and make sure it's working. And the 2551, I've noticed people are saying uh, is notoriously fickle. They've got a great habit of destroying themselves. They don't like static. Whereas here, you pick the board up, you push it into the socket, you press a couple of buttons, and there's your example, and you're off to the races. But while we're at it, for PMOD, you can get an Arduino shield, you can get a Raspberry Pi hat, you can get both types of prototyping board, by which I mean you can get a prototyping board where the prototyping board has got a PMOD socket on it. You can also get a prototyping board that plugs into a PMOD socket. 
And similarly with the micro ease, you can get both types of prototyping board. Schematics are always available and libraries are always available for all of these. There's an Arduino Uno shield that will take two microbus anythings. Well, I'll give you an example. We were looking at a shuttle, myself and Davey, uh, recently. And one of the things we were trying to do was make a signal that's both variable frequency and variable duty cycle. In order to do that, we needed to control uh, a high-speed high clock that we could then divide down to, to make a lower speed variable duty cycle thing. And in order to make a high speed clock, I simply took that, plugged that high speed clock chip into it and five lines of Arduino and we were off. There's the, the GPS disciplined oscillator that we saw earlier. There's another Raspberry Pi shield that will take a couple of these microbus sockets as well. When the design of the Pi was taking place, there was two big issues that were raised. One of them was lack of a real-time clock, and the other one was lack of analog I.O., not specifically not an analog input on the Raspberry Pi. People reckon that was the only thing it was missing. That little board gives you analog I.O., it gives you RTC, and it gives you the, the micro IOs as well. Now, the hard jar stuff that I talked about earlier on this just works. But whereas earlier I suggested when we were doing simple examples, what you do is you make it all into one great big combined file and convert it and then just save that file in the background. If you're going to use modules like this that you're going to reuse and reuse and reuse, then it makes sense to do the hard the hard jar made easy stuff and keep it in a jar module, which you can then reuse along with the, the thing when you're reusing it. So that's what we do. What I've done there is those includes at the top are simply modules. The first one's for the processor, the next one's for the development board, the next one's one of my own, and then the next two are for the clicks, the click LCD and the click DCC, and then some utilities that I need for, for what I'm doing. And basically, this is not unlike using IP in an FPGA situation. You simply include your stuff, and then further down here, you make it work. You write the, the code that starts it, loads it, unloads it, checks it, and the code is really, really easy. The one thing you have to worry about is that constraints file thing that we talked about. You need to either write, find, make, somehow develop your own constraints system to save you having to reinvent the wheel every time you use one of these modules. You can do it in paper. Once you get organized, you can do it on a spreadsheet. Whereas there's where all the pins go to on all the various development boards. Or if you get too much time in your hands, that'll be me, you can do a database whereby you say what development board you're using and what clickboard you're using, and it works out the connections for you. And at that point, you have to put those into your, your code and you're off to the races. Nearly done, some final thoughts. PMODs and clicks are the two that I use, so that's the two that I chose to speak about because I can comment on those but they're not the only games in town. X-Plane Pro is another one that Microchip have. It was part of the Atmel stable, and when Microchip took over Atmel, they sort of inherited x -Plained Pro. Grove is a, a little one. It's little wee white GST sockets that have four wires on them. A supply, a ground, and two other wires that are very typically 
SDA and SCL, they're mostly I squared C. Spark Fun have two, the Spark Fun Quick System and the Spark Fun Micro Mod, but they are proprietary connectors. The Spark Fun Micro Mod is the same. If you've ever had to use an M2 SSD, you know that little tight SSD connector that you get on modern motherboards? It's the same connector as that. And Spark Fun put processors and things like that on these boards. It's of interest, but it's not really for if you're going to be developing at home. You need to do some research before you commit. Micro E, Microelectronica, do not want to just to take all their code and run with it. So what they do is, if you've got one of their compilers, then if you download, remember the, the Libstock stuff that's got all the stuff for all the processors in all the languages? If you want to download one of those, it comes down as a compressed encrypted zip. In order to uncompress it, you need to have MicroE's package manager. And their package manager will only open one of these encrypted zips if you have the appropriate compiler installed on your machine. However, microchip do not covet their code so closely. So if you go to the microchip examples, there's 75 there. And once you've seen one SPI example and one I squared C example, you're there. You know, there's, there's 36 real-time clocks. If you go and look at two of them, the real-time clock for SPI and the real-time clock that runs under I squared C, you've more or less got it. So you can go to school simply on the similar examples. You don't need to buy the modules. The designs are published and you can just look at them. You don't need to buy or write or do firmware or software. Again, it can just be borrowed. You don't even need a development board for this. You can simply put these sockets onto your Vero board or your prototyping board. Using these things reminds me of something. Just can't think what it is that they remind me of. Any questions, folks?